hear from a group of uh, business leaders uh, talking about what their real life experience with taxes has been. And our moderator for that panel is Margaret Spellings, a former U.S. Secretary of Education and now the President of the U.S. Forum for Policy Innovation at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Margaret and panelists, please come up. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. All right, I love all this all education all the time, too. That's so fun. And, and also a great time to be a Texas braggadocio. So uh, it's thrilling to be in Illinois. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, special commendation to my friends Mark Langdale and Jim Glassman for, uh, for putting this panel together. We at the Chamber are very proud and pleased to be co-sponsors. Uh, I actually am wearing two hats. I'm also a, a newly minted board member of the Bush Foundation and, and I'm just getting to, uh, more familiar with some of the other work in addition to education, the global health, uh, the uh, human freedom and the various things. And so thank you for all the great work you do. Um, because I, I'm gonna take a tiny personal privilege and make my own commentary on the Chicago uh, strike since it's such a topical thing today. And uh, one of the silver linings, I think, is that we're seeing pretty much in, in stark relief this kids versus adults uh, kind of tension playing out and people uh, can, can see it for themselves. It's pretty raw, uh, the needs of adults and their issues and equities and comforts and such. Uh, versus the, the quality of education here, uh, here in this city, which of course is so integral to your, to your growth strategy uh, in its own right. So more to be said about that, obviously, uh, whoever said about the accountability uh, issues, that's the next gambit. Stay tuned. Uh, the next issue is let's bury the data. We're not gonna have charter schools and choice because we're gonna get rid of the, the bad news that tells us uh, really how, how uh, woefully inadequate our public schools are. There's lots of waivers coming out of Washington around those themes. So uh, anyway, don't get me started. Um, we are now here today uh, to talk about how the rubber meets the road. You've heard from uh, Brainiac academics uh, who uh, talk to the legislature about policy and so forth, and now we're gonna have the, a real treat to hear about what does this stuff mean uh, in reality, what does it mean to real life business people? And so I'm gonna get started, uh, not particularly in the order that you all are seated, gentlemen. This is a treat to be with such a, an august group of successful businessmen. Uh, Jimmy John, I'm gonna start with you, Jimmy. Uh, the, the person I first wanna begin with is probably doesn't need much in introduction, Jimmy John Lateau, founded Jimmy John's Gourmet uh, Sandwich Shops in 1983 in a converted garage in Charleston, Illinois at the age of 19. Since that time, he has grown to more than 1,400 uh, corporate and franchise locations in 42 states, so you're doing your own little laboratory about national tax policy, and is now the, the second uh, fastest growing chain of restaurants in the country. So congratulations on your terrific success, and, and we're thrilled to hear from you. So uh, obviously you've done business uh, over a long period of time. You do business and, or see about and hear about business practices around the country. Yeah. I mean, what do you hear and think about how that's impeding or, or aiding and abetting growth as you, as you work around the country? Well, uh, I, I'm not an expert to, to really answer, but what my, you know, where the rubber meets the road on that situation is, uh, uh, Michigan offered us uh, a three and a half million dollar package to move our, our we're, we're really in the royalty and training business and we're in Champaign, Illinois. Michigan offered us a three and a half million dollar package to move. Governor Mitch Daniels, as soon as he heard about us in Champaign, he called me immediately, introduced himself as Mitch and gave me his cell number and, uh, and wasn't just, I mean, he, was, he really, he called me a lot and really uh, wanted me to uh, spend some time with him. In Indiana, and I'll tell you that uh, city of Austin, Texas, sent a private plane for my wife, picked her up, with had three, uh, three Austin area businesses in 
uh, from Austin, a, a business president in that plane, took my wife to Austin and, and another lady from our office and toured them all around Austin for two days and uh, uh, came back. And of course, my wife liked that plane ride and, and really <laughs> loved Austin. And, uh, uh, and then, and then they, uh, a, a bunch of guys for, that run businesses in Austin were in my office six months ago, unsolicited, came to just spend a day. How we doing? How's it going? Mm -hmm. What can we do for you to have you there? And, uh, uh, so, uh, where the rubber meets the road is that's the reality of it, and um, uh, and for us, uh, in that we're in the in the training and royalty business, you know, I serendipitously ended up in Champaign, Illinois. Um, uh, uh, I moved there from Chicago. I lived in Lincoln Park, and I had a sales office in Elgin, and and I, I moved to Champaign uh, uh, serendipitously. I had. Uh, 10 stores that were fueling my franchise pump. It takes a while to fuel the prime the pump in the franchise business. And the fellow running them was, uh, it was time for him to go and time for me to jump back in. And so I did and, and this guy left and I took the stores over and, and, and ran that and slowly moved everybody and ended up in Champaign. There's a great airport there and we have a fleet of airplanes now. We open a restaurant every day and we're, we're flying just massive amounts of people around the country. We've done over 20,000 motel rooms in Champaign since January, uh, just from being bringing people from out of town for training. So we could take this up and move it anywhere we want. It's very portable, uh, but it's a it's a it's a huge business, and and we are uh, we we are just exploding, and 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 we it's very portable. That's where the rubber meets the road. And so, are you really thinking about that? I mean, do you? You know, are you are you uh, I'm, drawn I'm, to I'm, Austin, Texas, yeah, or to? I, well, I'm a Mitt Indiana? Romney delegate, and uh, so I'm going to be here until uh, until in January one. I'll be physically moving to Florida myself. I'll be moving um, uh, my licensing company and, and a lot of our income to Florida uh, myself. My wife's going to stay in Champaign with the kids, and uh, we'll file separate income tax returns. And I'm going to very much like not like Mother Nature. I mean, mm -hmm. water flows where it flows the easiest, and so so I like to fish and I like the sun. And, and my wife do and I do well two three days apart. We love each other. Perfect. And, uh, <laughs> I think you figured the whole so thing anyway, out, Jimmy. That's what we're going to do to start. Perfect. And um, but I think that you will probably see us out of Illinois and the next two to four years, and it will probably be Indiana or, or Austin, Texas, is, is, is if I was to guess. You're welcome anytime, my friend. Thank you. Um, uh, let, me, let me ask you, you know, Shamity, uh, Amity has, has written this, this very thoughtful piece in the Tribune today about, you know, price versus, versus trade and deal cities versus price cities. Your story is a city of deals, uh, as a story of deals. So how optimistic are you that in a place like Illinois, uh, a, a thoughtful group of policymakers would come around and say, you know, we're going to we're going to quit trying to pick winners and losers and and think of some uh, more reasoned tax policy that applied, applied more broadly. I mean, is that possible? Well, I mean, I wish it was possible. Uh, gosh, it, you know, because I don't mind paying my tax. I, I don't mind paying the five percent Illinois tax, and I don't mind paying the federal tax. I don't even mind paying the thirty-eight point nine or whatever the federal tax is going to go up to. But what I mind is how they spend the tax. I, I would stay, but the way they spend the tax is is what's really driving me away. If they if if I saw a direction of a, a change. In, in how they respect the dollar. I mean, we're in 1,500 locations every night between 2 and 5 in the morning scraping 25 cents of mayonnaise out of a Hellman's mayonnaise jar. And that's what we teach. And we, 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 make, we, we make it a dime at a time, and they just flush it down the toilet. And so they so disrespect the money. It's so difficult to make the money that we produce at Jimmy John's. So I, I have so much respect for the operation and the hard work that the answer to your question is I don't know the answer. If, if I saw it, I wouldn't be saying I'm going to, I'm going to Indiana or, or Austin, Texas. Bruce, you're a civic father and have been involved in a lot of these issues in your city. Bruce and I know each other from, uh, from education uh, championing. Uh, when you hear a story like that from Jimmy's, what do you think? I'm deeply saddened, outraged, and ready to fight to make that not the case for you and your fellow entrepreneurs. We have got to change the direction of our state. And the rest of us in this business community who've been here for our whole lives to say, enough, no more. We're not going to stay in this death spiral. We want great entrepreneurs like you to stay and thrive and build your companies and your jobs here in Illinois. That's what our future's about. Um, back story on us, I'm in the venture capital business, private equity business. We've helped start almost 100 companies we finance the growth of hundreds of companies, and we've been integral to the location decision of where they will base their operations, where they will base their headquarters. We've been the driving factor in, in much of that decision. 
it's driven me nuts for decades that we are unsuccessful in convincing many of the entrepreneurs that we back to headquarter in Illinois. And many of the companies that we've helped start in Illinois have decided to leave the state. I know dozens of business owners who've left. I know dozens of others who are ready to leave. I know many successful business executives who are born and raised here, and they're changing their residency. They're changing it to Florida. They're changing it to Texas. They're changing it to Nevada. We've got to say enough, no more. And it's, it's, it's in part about taxes, but it's really about confidence and value. It's, we've got to have confidence in our, in our government institutions. And in Illinois, for good reason, we have almost none. I mean, I, if, we, if you're going to invest in a new plant when you come to Illinois, I'd like to say yes, but I'd have to say no. And it's, taxes are a leading indicator of value. V value is driven by a lot of things, quality of life and cultural institutions and transportation ability, ability to recruit and retrain, uh, retain employees. Um, an ability for your employees to have good schools and safe neighborhoods for their employees to, uh, their families to live and thrive. All that factors into the decision. Whether the income rate is 3%, tax rate is 3% or 2%, it matters, but it's a leading indicator of all of those things. All those factors weigh into driving value for businesses. They'll go for that best value, the, the, the proper cost-benefit analysis for their companies. Uh, today, we are in a, the early stages of a long-term death spiral in Illinois, and we've got to rise up and take the state back for the benefit of our entrepreneurs, our value creators, our uh, school children who are our future and are retrieving uh, outrageously insufficient education today. Uh, we've got to take the state back. So uh, the name of Bruce's company is GTCR, and, and as he said, he's a very uh, uh, active uh, private equity investor. Pardon me. So how, what will it take to make the, why can't you all make the case to your policymakers around here that things are, are badly broken and, and what will it take to change the situation here to quit telling these horror stories of people leaving in droves, the kind of people you want to stay? Bruce, you start. Well, the, the, the bad news from our uh, horrible government policies in Illinois for the, la for the recent decades, our last three governors have been complete disasters. But, the, but the, the, the good news from that is things have gotten so bad that I hope the voters and the taxpayers are ready to revolt. And uh, whether it's the, the massive tax increase that got passed a couple years ago with absolutely no spending reforms attached to it at all at the time, it's incredible incompetence, incredible incompetence. And then when you look at the uh, pension liability, the politicians have been lying to the government workers, telling them they're going to have a pension. They're not. They're not going to get those pensions. They're lying to them, and they're lying to the voters, saying um, things are OK, trying to hide the fact that there's a massive accrued uh, liability for the pensions. There's no way we could ever pay those uh, pension liabilities today. There's going to have to be reform. The politicians here are so weak, so incapable of leading, they've just decided to abandon, sort of let the circumstances, let the bond market force the change, let uh, a tax revolt force the change, because they won't lead. We have got to replace them with leaders. I, the good news is I think there are so many people now upset with the tax hike that, and, and no spending reforms um, and the, the teachers walking out and, and claiming, uh, playing the blame for the bad schools on the taxpayers or on the poverty of the children rather than the incompetence of the teachers. People are going to get so outraged by this, they're going to begin to take the state back. I, I hope and believe we're in the early stages of a revolution here. Yeah, Jimmy, you're going to comment on that, and then we'll go to well, James. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I hope so too. I, I, I get uh, uh, there's a a, a large uh, uh, entitled uh, group in Champaign, Illinois, uh, uh, and um, I get <laughs> I get just blasted on the editor in the in the local newspaper out being such a horrible guy who does nothing but create jobs and has measurable accountability. And, <laughs> and uh, I mean, they they blast me. I'm absolutely you know lambasted uh, by by this group. Uh, but you know that's. Or there are two easy examples. There are several counties in, in Michigan that require us to put. Our, we have a bread oven where we bake. We have a, we manufacture the bread dough and, and freeze it and we ship it out to the stores. And and, and this is a, a, a this big profit center for us in selling the franchisees the bread dough. And we have an electric oven that's a no emissions bread oven. Several counties in Michigan where the unions are strong. 
they make us put in a stainless steel hood and air makeup system above this non-emission producing oven that requires no, uh, no, no, no uh, exhaust whatsoever because the union, the metal sheet metal workers union, they're twenty-five thousand bucks a shot. Well, every single one of our stores employs forty people. Well, ten ovens, or, or excuse me, ten restaurants equals a new e ten restaurants buying this unnecessary s steel. Is, is enough money for a whole brand new Jimmy John restaurant and 40 employees. And so th this, I mean, it's just a, per you say, how does regulation impede growth? Every 10 stores of these worthless, you know, I mean, is stainless steel that abundant that we should just blow it like that? So there, there's an example. And, and, and another one, just, just to understand things, in, and I need to understand things in third grade language or I don't get it. And so uh, like every bill that comes in my office today, we pay today so my desks aren't dirty. I mean, simple things yeah. like that. You crazy. Okay. But let me just jump on this one. I have, a, I have a cousin who's a commercial fisherman in Chatham in the Cape. Three generations fishing cod. Several years ago, the government decided to regulate the codfish because they're decimating the codfish population, according to the government specialists. So they start uh, regulating the codfish, uh, cod fishing industry and saying that you can only catch X number of pounds. So they're coming into the harbor with, with, with their, their, their fish and they're over 2,000 pounds, so they're throwing the dead fish in the ocean so they don't get a ticket, okay? So now, the, so this, so, so now, now that they regulated this, what happened is, is that the fish prolifer proliferated and, 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 and uh, sea, uh, Sea lions came in to a place where there were never sea lions. So now, now the, there were all the wealthy folks. They go to the beach and they go to the Cape, and, and now there's sea lions all over the beach and the Cape. Well, three or four years ago, the great white sharks started showing up, eating the sea lions that are eating the fish. Now, so now, now, now the beaches are closed in, Ch in the Cape. The beaches are closed. Sea lions are like pigeons laying all over the beach, and and I don't know where the rich people are going now or where the people are going. So they destroyed the entire industry, and 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 uh, you know, and and and, and the do-gooders are all, you know, living in Seattle, saving whatever they did. Uh, anyway, this is... Just... You'll probably see some of them in Florida. I think one of the things you've just done is, is tell some stories in such stark and real and authentic ways that that's the, that's the sort of thing we need to do more of, if certainly at the Chamber of Commerce. James, uh, so you are the alter ego to, to Jimmy, I suspect. Uh, from New Zealand. James is the, I want to get your title right, uh, it started as an assistant manager and, and uh, worked his way up to a general manager and is now the COO and company president of Jimmy John's. So talk about what you see as you run this company and as you see and in, interact with, with business people around this country, franchisees, uh, and, and what their decision making process is like. Well, uh, it's really exciting being from New Zealand uh, I came from a country with three million people and limited opportunity. And here you come to the United States with over 300 million people and, and I saw a vision in Jimmy that we could build a business, that we could build that. And we started doing that a long, long time ago. Jimmy's been doing it for 30 years. And we have now 1,400 stores. And if you take Illinois, for example, we have in, in Chicago, we have 188 stores in the Chicago DMA with 75 franchisees. Our largest competitor is Subway, who has over 800 stores in Illinois. And our 75 franchisees, they're really excited. They want to keep growing, they want to grow more, and they want to open up more stores. And what I see from our business side of running our business is we've got 75 franchisees who want to, want to open a second store, they want to open a, a third store and a fourth store, and they're looking around going, where can we do that? And where are they incentivized to do that? And it would be exciting to do it here in, in the great state of Illinois, but they are looking elsewhere. They're looking at Florida. They're looking at Texas. They're looking at Indiana. Uh, because if you take our biggest competitor, Subway is over 25,000. We've got 1,400 stores. I think, I think Subway is our second biggest competitor. I think the government's our first competitor. <laughs> Go ahead, James. I'm and, sorry. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and so. That, I think, is a big challenge for our franchisees. It's really exciting. Either way, we've got this great growth in our company, and we've got a great opportunity. We'd love to keep those 75 franchisees here in the state of Illinois and keep growing here, but uh, they're going to grow one way or the other because they do want to keep growing, and that, that's a big challenge that we see uh, with Illinois. 
So, um, so Bill, uh, I'm going to now introduce my friend Bill Little, who is, uh, in addition to being a real live businessman himself, which I'll tell you about in a second, is the chairman of the National Chamber Foundation and has been very active in the Chamber of Commerce for many, many years. And it's been a privilege to work with you, Bill, over the years. He is also the president and CEO of the Quam Nichols Company, a manufacturing uh, company of commercial and industrial audio products uh, right here in the city of Chicago. And uh, so I want to ask you this question in two ways. One, your own personal experience in running your business and how this all comes home to roost uh, yourself, but also with your chamber hat on as we've worked on a product called Enterprising States uh, and, and traveled around, visiting with governors around the country, what you've heard and seen in, in that broader context. Okay, fine, Margaret. I'd be delighted. But let me first go back to uh, something that Jimmy said. Number one, we're going to miss you, Jimmy. <laughs> um, when you leave. But in Illinois, when you talk about a governor giving you his cell number, it has a whole different connotation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I need to figure out. Margaret, as you know, the National Chamber Foundation has spent a great deal of time in recent years on this project that we call Enterprising States. And we have, we have gotten some world-class experts to examine states across the country and pick out the eight or 10 things that distinguished them and then relate it to the success of their economy. And it's been an eye-opener. And we have, uh, we have learned a good deal. I hope that we have conveyed a lot of those messages. We've met with a number of governors. We've had an annual program in Washington that have attracted a number of governors. So often is the case, we tend to preach to the faithful. We tend to talk to governors who have been successful, as Governor Daniels is a, is a classic example. But I think one of the things that we have sensed, and it certainly uh, uh, appeals to everybody who does business in Illinois today, the idea appeals, is that tax rates are really, really important. But even more important is tax uncertainty not knowing who's going to pay the bill and when it's going to be delivered creates more problem for business than rates. Businesses learn to accommodate cost, and taxes are one cost. And they work around it. They find a way. They price their product accordingly, whatever it might be. But the uncertainty is a, an enormous stifler of progress. And it's hard for me to imagine that anybody is going to invest in this state um, either in facilities or in people until this uncertainty goes away. And oddly, Jimmy and some of his peers who have been so successful in this state um, are getting ready to leave before the check comes. I don't, I don't blame you for it. It's for obvious reasons. But, this, <laughs> but he brings more uncertainty. Uh, this is being at a restaurant table with eight people that you're sort of acquainted with, don't know them very well, a lot of uh, expensive wine being consumed, and people start leaving before the check comes. <laughs> um, that's, what we're see that's what we're seeing in Illinois. Uh, no, Jimmy, I, I understand that, that you're, not, you're not leaving, they're driving you out with a stick. But on the other hand, it increases the uncertainty, which is enormously damaging to anybody that's running a business. Okay, so you're running a company here in Illinois and are, I guess, going to be here when the check comes. Talk I, about I, I'm your afraid own, that I'll be here when the check in comes. In your own company and what it, what it might mean to, to a, a growth solution or Well, what it means any... right now is that um, we are very hesitant to invest in either people or in process. It's, there's sort of a sense of let's wait, let's, let's hold back, let's, let's work some overtime, let's do various and sundry things until we get a much better sense of what's going to happen. And I think that uh, that prevails. I think there's an awful lot of Illinois businesses who are doing exactly the same thing. Oddly enough, as you well know, one of the Chamber's issues nationally has been that, that uh, we suffer from uncertainty. And, and I think they make a very strong case that, that the reasons that corporation, American uh, corporations have accumulated so much cash is because they're unwilling to make decisions because of the uncertainty. If that's the case, this state is the poster child for it. Mm -hmm. So, Bruce, is it just tax uncertainty, or what, what other issues do you hear about from the, the people, the companies that you interact with in your work? Again, it's all about what we describe. To me, it's the word confidence. It's, it's can we believe that the long-term opportunities to run a business in Illinois are strong or, or not? 
and tax policy is one, but there are many factors. One of the reasons I've gotten more engaged in these issues in the last 10 years is when our, the governor before our, most, our current one started to spend us into oblivion, my partners rose up and said, Bruce, let's move. But this is, this is not going to end well. We only have 100 people in our firm, and we can locate anywhere. We could go to Dallas. We could go to Atlanta, where some of my partners are from. And, and we could move in a couple months, save a lot of money, great, great transportation, ability to recruit people, let's move. And I said, no way. I'm from here. That's one of my flaws, but I love it here. And I want to fight. I'd rather fight and change what's going on here rather than leave. Unfortunately, I, uh, unfortunately, I was able to persuade my partners to stick it out for a while. I don't know if, you know, will they do it for another 10 years? I don't know. Um, there's, I'm going to fight all the way to, with everything I've got. But many businesses that we want to invest in, they're leaving. Mm -hmm. And they're going to Tennessee, which is a very well-run state. They're going to Texas, a very well-run state. They're going to Florida. They're going to Georgia. They're going to well-run states where they have confidence and they're getting value for their tax dollar, value for their infrastructure in the environment that the government's creating for their business. And we're not creating that here in Illinois. We've got to change that. So, you know, as Bill said, we do a lot of preaching to the choir. Every person in this room gets these issues and so forth. How can we change that? I mean, it's the people, Jimmy, that work for you. Yeah. The, and, and Bill, the people that work for you that are not, you know, sitting around reading Amity's, you know, learned piece in the, in the Tribune. Sorry, Amity. Um, but, but how can we convince the folks that are not getting this clearly that they need to be part of this joint Bruce and rise up and help pay the check? Well, I, I graduated second to last in my high school class. And uh, uh, it's so hurt you. I was, uh, no, I was, uh, I, I pushed the envelope. You know, I was, uh, I just did. And uh, <laughs> no, but, but I, I, no, in, in all seriousness, I married a great woman and, and really, it's she really true. shaped me and, and uh, <laughs> you know, she taught me great stuff and I, and I just love her dearly. But, but I learned all my lessons in life from pain. I, 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 learned, I learned how to be a leader when I first opened my first store in Charleston I, with two of my friends and they both quit. And they quit and left me alone. I'm in the shop. And I learned to work from 8 in the morning to 2.30 in the morning. And I learned I could do it seven days a week. And then I learned I could do it 14, 21. Then I learned that I loved it and I wouldn't melt. And there was nobody to sue for so much pain anyway. So I just, you know, I, I embraced it and, and did it. But, but I, I learned from pain. When I felt that, that's where my lessons came from. Um, I'm a little brash. I'm, you know, I'm softening it a little bit. Because I, you know, and, and, and because I, you know, I, I, I might be a little offensive. You know what I mean? So the lessons I've learned in life, I've learned from getting smacked in the head and feeling pain. We in the free market have felt the pain and we've adjusted our lifestyles and adjusted ourselves to, to we, I haven't risen prices at Jimmy John's in about six years I've had the same price. I've absorbed 10 points in, uh, uh, in, 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 in profit um, uh, over, the, over the, that time period. We collect more in sales tax from our stores in Champaign than we make an in income from our six stores in Champaign. We collect more for the state and sit in sales tax and send it off to them. They do nothing, you know. So I'd like to be on that anyway. Um, <laughs> but the bottom line is until you feel pain, you don't change. You know, until you feel pain, things, it's, it's, nothing's going to happen. And so what we could, you know, they're starting to feel the pain. And, there, and, and there's nothing that I would like more. I, I'm partners in some, some great high-end restaurants in, in Phoenix and in California with a great entrepreneur named Sam Fox. And there's nothing I'd like better than to envision a 50 thousand, hundred thousand square foot Jimmy John's campus in Champaign, Illinois. And for all the, the 200 people that I have for three weeks in a row in Champaign for training, a, a, a hotel, a Jimmy John's hotel that could be a, the highest quality, low cost provider, they give them a choice to stay in that hotel and, 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 and put that up. And I farm almost 5,000 acres in Champaign County. I, I like farming and, and, I, and I, you know, there's nothing I'd like more than have this vision of staying there and, and bringing some of these great restaurants to Champaign because the good food is so mediocre in Champaign. It's Horrible, actually, <laughs> and I want to go. I want to go do it, and I want to go bring greatness in the fine dining segment of Champagne. Um, uh, my mentor Jamie Coulter here founded Lone Star Steakhouse, and and uh, uh, Jay, they they just shut down the Lone Star Steakhouse in Champagne, and they're and they knocked it down, and they're putting up a, a Five Guys and a Chipotle in, in your location. I don't know if you knew that, Jamie, but uh, I have ADD. I wear that okay, okay, yeah. but <laughs> I just I, I would love to be able to envision this and execute that. It would be the, it would be the greatest thing in the world. I could stay where I live, where I love. I love Champagne. I love farming. I love deer hunting. I, I love 
I love, okay, I love my friends right. and neighbors, and, but I, I can't do that now. I, I got to go to Florida. Okay, all right. Texas is still so in the running. Okay, Bruce, uh, let, let's talk about, you know, building, before we go to, to questions from, from the audience, you know, building a political constituency for change, and what is it going to take to make people mad enough, smack them in the head, to use your artful phrase, um, to, to get policymakers to respond? I mean, what specifically can we and should we do? Well, the good news is I think many uh, of the leaders of the business community are beginning to get active and to begin to form coalitions and to speak out. The business community, frankly, has been mm -hmm. held hostage a little bit in Illinois for quite a while. I, they suffer in what, uh, I don't know, from uh, what I like to call the Stockholm Syndrome. They've been held hostage for so long mm -hmm. that they sort of start to get the mindset of their captors. And we've got to break out of that mindset. Um, it's beginning, and I think this tax, uh, massive tax hike with no spending reforms and the clear bomb that's about to go off in our pension system are two, two of the instigating factors for that. Uh, from there, it's going to take a lot of ground game building, so that, you know, what, and it's going to take various constituents who just want freedom and more limited government. And whether it's Tea Party factions, whether it's the Republican Party base, whether it's um, business, small business owners who just see the crush, as Jimmy does, of government and better alternatives elsewhere, it's going to take these f folks all coming together. The good news is um, the education reform uh, movement is coming to join the whole effort. They see this as all intertwined, low quality, high cost government that's ineffective, is, is bur uh, bear, uh, just crushing the future of our children, and the reform community is uniting with the business community on these points. That's the great news. And uh, John Tillman raises, I think, a very important issue as well. In, in Illinois, there's been a long time history of what I would call social service, social justice, a, a bigger role for government in, 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 in a safety net than in many other states. We could all argue good or bad about that, but that is true. And what's, what's interesting, I think there's a, there's a wedge issue here that John touched on that I want to emphasize. We cannot afford, we will crush our economy if we try to spend money on both high cost, inefficient, bureaucratic, heavily unionized government and a social safety net to help the disadvantaged, the weak and the poor, which many of us would like to be able to do. We can't afford both. We will crush the economy. All the wealth creators like Jimmy will leave and we'll be done. We have to make a choice. I think we can drive a wedge issue on, uh, in the Democratic Party on that topic and bring the folks who say, you know what, for our tax dollars, I'd rather help, help the disadvantaged, the handicapped, the, the, um, the elderly, the, the, the children in poverty. I'd rather have my tax dollars going to that than um, the SEIU or AFSCAMI who are uh, out there for <laughs> their own interests. And they're, 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 they're crushing, their, 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 it's their pensions, it's their pay, it's their outrageous health care costs. And, and what doesn't get much play is their work rules. I don't know, you know, another topic that is yet to really get it, their restrictions on who can work in government, what their background has to be. How, we can't hire good people into government because they have to have worked their way up in the AFSCAMI system. It's, it's preposterous. The, the whole structure of union control of our government has got to change. And there, the good news is I think there are a lot of interest groups coming together to help drive that change. Okay, questions for our panels. Tell us who you are and who your question is directed <coughs> to or if it's directed to anyone. Where's the microphone? Up here. This man right there. Uh, Jimmy, do you have approximately 50, 60,000 employees? Correct. And uh, the philosophy of, of your business is a low-cost producer, lots of value to the customer, a business that can grow. Is that right? Yes. What percent of those employees do you think just the philosophy that you've exposed them to will turn out to be conservative Americans? 59,000 because the other 1,000 haven't heard yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jimmy for president right now. Okay, other questions, comments? Yes, up here in the with the blue blouse. How about another wedge issue, which is the good teachers shouldn't be supporting this strike because those 40% of the kids who don't graduate are going to cost welfare and jails. They're not going to be paying for their pensions. Uh, that, uh, Outstanding point, I strongly agree. That we, a critical issue, we have to separate the union from the teachers. They're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. The union basically is elected politicians elected to do certain things, get more pay, 
more uh, benefits, less work hours, more job security. That's, that's, what, that's what they paid to do. They're not about the students. They're not about results. They're not about the taxpayers. It, 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 that's irrelevant to the union bosses. We have to be crystal clear on that. Most teachers care deeply about their students. Most teachers work hard or highly effective. Trouble is the union blocks them from being known. The union wants every teacher treated the same. They want no teacher differentiated, no teacher based, paid differently based upon the quality of their work. So if you're a highly talented professional, why do you want to go into that union system? Or if you're in it, you're stuck there and your voice isn't heard. We've got to break, break apart that, on exactly that issue. Break the union bosses away from the really talented teachers. That's doable. It's not, not easy, but that's doable and critical to improving the, the schools long term. So what's your prediction about what, how this story ends here? Well, if the story is the strike, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. it doesn't end well. Uh, I think we've, we've given in on a fair number of critical issues. Um, Will uh, they get a deal today? Uh, it's unclear. I, I'm betting they probably will, um, but uh, unknown. But th this, is, this is one battle in a very long-term fight. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, whether, wherever we come out on it, the, the good news, long-term, the taxpayers are frustrated in this city, and they're beginning to, to push back. And very importantly, the parents are awakening to the issues in, in the city. And I think we're going to have a multi-year revolution. It'll build. I think this strike, frankly, the good news from the strike is I think we're going to have a coalescing of interest and some focus and drive some major change. And there are some plans in the works, some charter community innovations, education inno innovators who are now focusing on Chicago. And I think in the coming years, we can, we can be begin a major transformation. So Bill, Jimmy, James, do your employees sit there and look at these, the benefits and the pension packages and the job security of the teachers and think, wait a minute, I'm out here busting my chops every day. I mean, are there wedge issues within no, the no, populace? Uh, no question about it. I think there's reason for optimism over that point. The employees of ours are unionized. They're, they're members of International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, a private sector union. Mm -hmm. And I think there, this teacher strike is an example of where there is not a union interest. There is a public sector union interest, and there's a private sector union interest. And I think you would hear from, uh, from people, union leaders in the private sector, that their members' children are getting inferior educations, the services that they should be delivered to them are not being delivered at an enormous cost to these people and without any comparison to the kinds of wages and benefits that their, their union brothers in the public sector enjoy. So I think that could very well be a, a change in, in Illinois politics, at least, that the union movement would be split over these issues. Interesting. Question over here, Nick. Hi, I'm Nick Schultz with AEI and uh, <coughs> NCF. Thanks for a terrific panel. Uh, we've heard a lot about tax policy. Obviously, taxes are important. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the regulatory climate in Illinois. Uh, especially as we have panelists who've, who've uh, uh, built and grown businesses in Illinois over a long period of time. Has it changed? Uh, and how, uh, how does the regulatory climate influence decisions about allocating capital, about expanding, and, and so on and so forth? So, Bill, we'll start with you and work our way back. Well, this is a touchy one. I, I don't want 14 inspectors from 15 different uh, <laughs> bureaus uh, at my office door in the morning. Um, let me, let me, Nick, let me turn the question around a little bit. And, and uh, one of the, Chicago has been a good place to do business. It's been a really good place to do business over the years because the administrations in the past have been pro-business. And in times past when there was a regulatory issue, a, a uh, a question about whether our employees were parking in a place that was appropriate after they'd done it for 30 years, that you could call the mayor's office and you could get a resolution. You knew you could get a resolution and you knew that, that a regulator was not going to run amok. Um, but I think as time goes by, you have less confidence that you have that out, that you have the ability to seek the, uh, uh, the support of the, of the city administration. Yeah. Um, so the regulatory thing is, is problematic. Uh, there, are, there are people who are um, tasked with regulating us that, that show up at our door. We've never heard of them. 
We have no idea what it is they're looking for. Um, we have no idea how to respond to them. Um, and, and Jimmy knows this better with, with your number of locations. It's, it can be a real distraction. You, you've got a plan for the week. You're going to get these things done. And some guy shows up and says, I'm here to look at this. Mm -hmm. James, Jimmy. I, I'll jump in on, the, on that one. We have, uh, we're very efficient with what we do. And with, with it, when a restaurant opens up, no matter what city it's in, we typically pass the first time we get our, to get our final uh, occupancy permit, which comes from the health inspector. And we typically pass the first time. But in general, it takes three or four times to pass. And they like to put that in their schedule. They get a car ride. They get a smoke. <laughs> they get to come into your, uh, up into your place and tell you, where. well, we're so proactive that we pass the first time. And what we find in different communities, they're just not ready for you to be so absolutely 100% ready to go. I mean, we're ready to get the permit and turn the lights on and sell sandwiches, you know, as they're walking out the door. Um, so they're quite surprised by, by, by the fact that, you know, but we're paying rent and we've got employees there and we're ready sure. to rip. Sure. And uh, uh, so it's uh, uh, sometimes they just want to just fail us for silly reasons. I mean, uh, uh, Green two. with the ramp after the fact. Oh, yeah. We, well, yeah, we, we opened a restaurant uh, in, in Champaign, one of our six corporate units there, and it was down on the campus. It was open for about three years. And uh, uh, the local government came to us and said, uh, you need to uh, rebuild the front of your restaurant so that uh, uh, we can get wheelchairs uh, in here easier. It's too steep. And it was uh, uh, about $60,000 to do. And I said, well, why don't we just put a, a, a buzzer at the door? And, and, and if somebody is in a wheelchair, they can buzz. They can make the order, and we'll bring it out to them. They said, what if it's raining out? I said, I'll extend my canopy. And, uh, and I said, then we all win. And I buy a, a buzzer at Walmart and install it, and we're good to go. And, um, uh, but anyway, and I said, what if I was a, a small business? What if I couldn't afford the $60,000? I said, would you guys shut me down? And, and well, that's not the case, Mr. Leoto. And, and I've said, right, it's not the case. Anyway, we, <laughs> we ended up spending the $60,000 and did it. And they said, we'd been open for three years. The business was doing great. Yeah. Um, these guys do wheelies. They can get in there, and they're. I mean, it was. It's a. It's a very. It's a very. <laughs> okay. It's a very. No, it's a very handicapped centric campus. It really is, and we, and they're buzzing. We're, we were serving them brilliantly, yeah. but before this, right? Yeah, and bringing them in the back and helping them in. There was no issues. There's no issues. So, Bruce, what do you see yeah, in the regulatory? I think your question arena. on this regulatory issue is critically important. We're talking mostly about tax today, but this regulatory environment, the business environment here is probably just as important or more important. Mitch Daniels loves to tell me, Bruce, I love your worker comp rules in Illinois. I love your workers comp rules. He's stealing our little manufacturing companies, our little distribution businesses all the time because of our workers comp issues. Um, we're, our tort, our, our, our legal structure here, I, we're big healthcare investors. We can't keep many of our healthcare service businesses in Illinois because the, the, the legal liabilities, the restrictions, the regulations in healthcare in Illinois, very prohibitive. Yeah. And they, so they moved to Tennessee, they moved to Texas, they moved other places. Um, our, uh, the cost, Jimmy did a, cl made a class example about the requirement for steel hoods. We have, our companies in Illinois, they, they have all these requirements around all kinds of stuff. You couldn't even make it up. You can't imagine the kinds of things that Illinois makes companies do that really uh, create marginal or no benefit but have significant cost. And any one of them maybe is not fatal, but when you put them all together, yeah. They, they become very burdensome. Yeah. And, and Illinois' business climate is hostile to companies. Yes. It is. Yes. We can all, you know, say, you know, it is. And we, it, it, it's, it, we have got to be comprehensive in the approach. We can't do one little thing like the, like the legislature tried to do. They said they got workers' comp changed, and so then they want to say they achieved it and it's done. All they did was lower the amount of money they pay for doctors who treat um, uh, uh, injured workers. Trouble is, they didn't get in, and uh, the, the core issue is many of the people claiming workers' comp didn't get issue, work hurt on the job. We're, and oh, are we dealing with that? No. You know, they're, they're, we're, we're, we're always scratching the surface and claiming victory and leaving the core problem there. It's, it's going to take a major transformation to fix that. Yes, sir, right over here <clears throat> on my right. Well, Nielsen, excellent panel. I would like to do a little pushback, though on the issue of whether or not the teachers uh, are not the union. Uh, live in Lake Forest, and we're enjoying our own little uh, show up there of the most uh, highly paid teachers in the state sitting on the, 
on the front lawn in their lounge chairs with their Starbucks being delivered. Uh, this is the picket line in Lake Forest. The other, uh, the, the real point though is that uh, according to several very well placed moles uh, within the faculty, that with the exception of the athletic department, there aren't five conservatives on the entire faculty. They are either liberal or uber liberal and they push their politics in what should be the home of capitalism <laughs> in the, on the North Shore of Lake Forest. So the idea that, that the teachers and the unions are really separated while both sides mouth all the platitudes about it's for the kids uh, doesn't hold up. And the recent Chicago vote where 90% of the teachers voted to go out, you know, that wasn't for the kids. So I don't think we can make that clear delineation uh, between the two. The, the famous Stanker line, when kids start paying union dues, I'll start representing them, right? Yeah, no, I, you raise a very good point. I can't disagree. My point is the union and the teachers will always be aligned around pay. They're always going to push together on pay, even the good ones. They're all united on that. Where they're not united is in evaluation and differentiating quality instruction. The good teachers know they'll do fine. They've got the confidence. I've talked to them. I know. It's the weak teachers. It's the lousy, ineffective, lazy teachers. And unfortunately, there are a fair number of those. They're the ones that the union is protecting, and that's where there's a conflict of interest between the good teachers and the union bosses. Other questions? I think we probably have time for about two more. Yes, back here on the right. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rick Furfer. Um, I certainly understand and agree with a lot of the short-term calculations that the business people are making in regard to whether to stay or go from the state of Illinois and from the city of Chicago. And I apologize if I sound too much like a futurist, but I was wondering to what extent the state in trying to keep people uh, and business people factor into their calculations. Uh, the fact that as the century grinds on, one of the greatest uh, natural resources, one that people will be fighting over, is water, fresh water. And we have right here Lake Michigan, we have access to the Great Lakes. Jimmy John, if you move to Austin, you will be welcome to uh, perennial droughts uh, and uh, hot, dry summers. When you go to Florida, uh, good luck. Uh, you may need to build your own desalinization plant down there. Uh, Florida and Georgia have already had skirmishes over fresh water. What about Indiana? Uh, it, relative to the other states around the Great Lakes, it's not an issue. We're all in a compact together as it is. And I believe our lobbyists that, that represent the compact have already been battling against a pipeline that the states in the Southwest want built so they can start siphoning uh, our fresh water down to that part of the country. So the question is, what kinds of factors other than the short-term tax uh, and economic considerations are being used or thought about to keep people here in Illinois? Jimmy? Yeah, mine are just the reality, and, and water flows where it flows the easiest, and, it, and, 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 and that's really uh, none. The short-term is where it's at. And uh, long term, you know, I mean, long term is important, but, uh, you know, the water issue is, is, is going to be figured out. And, and uh, um, so I, I don't know how to gauge. I, I actually never thought about the water issue. And um, um, but for me, it's, it's really uh, the direction of the state and, and uh, more so the direction of the state than the tax issue. Because, I, again, I don't mind the 5 percent state tax here in Illinois. I just mind how they spend it. And, uh, and if they were spending it efficiently, uh, I'm all in. I, I, would, I, would, I would spend millions and millions of dollars in Champaign building my campus, regardless of what the guys on the other side of Neal Street think of me. Um, and uh, I would do it, but uh, it's, it just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Jim? I'm just oh, you're just signaling. No, okay, no, okay. No, well, it says, it's just 257. I know, but I want to do something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been a fabulous panel, but I want to take the opportunity to put Margaret on the spot because I think that her uh, comments in the beginning were right on point, but a little elliptical. So um, if you don't mind, we have, a, we have a former U.S. Secretary of Education here. And did you want to elaborate on anything you had to say about 
about the Chicago story, especially, let's say, teacher evaluation or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think just quickly, and maybe I was a little too obtuse before I was trying to be polite, but since these gentlemen didn't, didn't uh, take my cue and have been very, <laughs> uh, very overt in their commentary, I, I will do likewise. Well, I think what we're seeing, obviously, as I said, this kids versus grown-ups deal, and the game is, is obviously, to Bruce's point, you know, all about the things that, that are going to differentiate. The, the game is the things that differentiate quality from from failure, uh, ways to distinguish better people using tests to evaluate teachers, using uh, uh, principal discretion to assign our best people to do the most challenging work. That is exactly the opposite of what we do now. If you have a PhD and lots of experience and have been on a contract for a long time, you select that you're going to do the easiest uh, work in the system, and then we're surprised when we get uh, terrible results with bad teachers and failing schools. So this is the sort of thing that has to be busted open, and it is not going to be busted open uh, if we walk back from accountability, from transparency, from assessment, from from kind of the no child left behind type principles that said, you know, damn it, change or do something about it. And we're seeing those things walked back in state legislatures. The administration is giving out a lot of waivers to states, you know, watch the birdie sort of stuff. Um, and, and that's where I think the business community, once again, and the civil rights community have to be really paying attention in this renewed era of local control where you've got the ball and, um, you know, your parents are counting on you. Thank you. And um, yeah, I, should, I should also say that at the Bush Institute, we're all about accountability. Our, our, our leader has taught us that, uh, that teachers and administrators need to be accountable to students and their, and their families. And I, and I think in this panel, one of the things that, that Jimmy John said that's just so, I thought was so powerful was, and he said it again, that he, he doesn't mind paying the tax. What he minds is what the money is being spent for. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think, those are, I think those, that, that's a very good way to, to say it because we, we are lacking in accountability. Anyway, I want to thank this panel, which thank was just can. terrific. And, um, tell you that uh, we're going to take a 15 minute break. We're going to come back and I'm going to have the pleasure of, uh, of doing a short, a short discussion with David Booth from Dimensional Fund Advisors. Uh, then we're going to go on to our, our, our third panel, which is also a great panel with Dan Proft and uh, Ike Brannan and um, Brian Westbury of the, the Bush Institute and uh, John Cochran and Congressman Aaron Schock. So take a break. Thank you.